Last Sunday, we finished our lengthy series. Actually, it wasn't all that lengthy, only 20, 20 Sundays on 2 Corinthians. I say it's not really that lengthy because my son-in-law, when he became ordained like three years ago, whatever it was, he started preaching through Luke, and he's still in Luke. So, um, so my 20 sermon series is not, nothing at all. Uh, <clears throat> and what I want to start next, and I've been planning this for months now, is a series on spiritual warfare. And I really feel like it's a timely thing. The more I talk to people in the church, the more I think it's not just happenstance that I would think it's time to talk about spiritual warfare. Um, A preface to that series is a reminder from Ephesians chapter 6 that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And so we'll spend probably around eight weeks or so looking at spiritual warfare, the nature of it, the origin of it, who our enemy is, um, how we can be victorious against spiritual attacks in the spiritual realm that we just read about. So I want you to look forward to that, but also be, be prepared spiritually for it. Maybe even this week, as you go through your week, you'll, you'll become more aware that, that it's not just the flesh you're fighting, it's not just nature, it's not just p- other people. But there's something else going on. You might even notice that you're having greater attacks in your spiritual life, in your faith, and just just problems. And I want you to begin to think in terms of spiritual warfare and, and what is it that you're really up against. Because if you know what you're up against, you will have the opportunity to use the weapons that we're given. So we don't have to be defeated and worn down, but actually can be victorious because of the same victory that, that Christ exhibited when he rose from the grave and defeated Satan. So um, please be mulling this over this week in preparation for next Sunday. And we are going to have this morning Bill Walters share a message with you. Um, every time he, he does one, he no sooner gets done, he says, I'm working on another one. And about three days ago, he said, I'm all ready to go. It's, it's all set to preach. And I said, well, I'm in between series, so it's probably better now to have you come and share than to get one or two messages into my new series and then take a break. It just seemed to make sense. So I offered him the, the chance, and he responded basically with a, with a haircut. Um, Annie, thank you for that haircut that you gave our brother yesterday. Um, we all, all pre- people at home on the live stream really appreciate it. So uh, he's here in good form this morning. Bill, why don't you come up? We're so glad that you do share from God's Word and the way you, you share from your heart and your, your absolute love for Jesus. Um, it's so evident, and I'd say every year I've known you, I see more and more of your love for Jesus and your desire to minister and to share in, in many different kinds of ways. So thanks for that. Thank you, George. Andy, get a haircut. I, had to get, I got mine. You got to get yours. My wife wouldn't let me come up here in front of the church without a haircut, so I got uh, an Annie do, and it's beautiful. So today, um, I'll be preaching to you out of John, which is my favorite gospel, okay? And it's different than all the other gospels. Um, There's a lot of parable in John. And a parable is a simple story used to illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson, and Jesus used this all the time. Unfortunately, uh, as he used these lessons, there's a lot of people that didn't, uh, didn't didn't get the drift. Even his 12 disciples sometimes, after he had talked about this parable, they would come to him later and he'd go, what do you mean? What, what, what did you say? And he'd have to explain it to them, right? And sometimes he'd just say, you know, are you so dull that I have to continue to do this? He's like, why aren't you getting, why aren't you getting quicker about this? So anyway, John chapter 6, verses 64 through 69, and it says, but there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it's granted him by the Father. After this, many of the disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. 
So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. If you've been a Christian for any length of time, you, you have seen people come and go. Some are famous people who even rejoice, where everyone rejoices over at their conversion, hoping it will influence many people only to see them convert or something else six months later. But what happens is they come to the church and exactly six months later or even less, they stop talking about Jesus, okay? And they convert to something else. They come to the church to make a profession of faith and then something the preacher might say makes them turn away. And you know what? The preachers sometimes say things that are hard. And when you're a brand new Christian, you don't understand them. And so they walk away. And if they don't know someone in the church, if they can't understand that this person is a person I can go to and say, hey, what did he just say? I don't get it and I don't like it. That person can look at them and eye to eyeball to eyeball and tell them this is what he meant. And it is that way. And he can, they can show them in the Bible that it's that way so that they understand, so they don't just pick up their bags and walk off. Sometimes the preacher presents a hard message, but it's got to be given. Also, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you have gone through times where circumstances have caused you to have doubts or fears. I don't know if that's happened to any of you, but I can tell you I've had my share of the doubts and the fears. I've told you this story over and over again about my friend Kurt Alt, who would dis disciple me, and I'd have these doubts and fears about my faith, and he would open the Bible up, and he would read from the Bible, and I'd say, well, I don't, I don't really believe that. And one day, the, the first time that he said that, I said that to him, he took the Bible page and ripped it out, crumbled it up, and threw it in the garbage. He goes, now the Bible is yours. Now you believe exactly what's in the Bible. Well, you know, that was a hard message for me. Uh, but it makes a lot of sense, right? <laughs> People may have hurt you, or an unwise comment from the pulpit made you think about quitting church. Again, sometimes we say things that are taken the wrong way out there in the body, okay? And instead of asking the question from somebody, even go back to the pastor and ask what did you mean? Eh, they just get angry, they get upset, and off they go. It may have been that someone speaking the truth in love about your pet sin that has made you want to run. Don't we all have a pet sin? We have. If you are sitting here today and you're looking at me and going, I don't have any sins. Come and talk to me, because I need to get that straight, okay? So we could talk to the parable of the seed. See, we're going to go to parable. Parable of the seed and the sower. As many use that to explain people leaving the church and even leaving God behind. Matthew 13 says, That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered about him. So that he got into a boat and, they, and he sat down and the whole crowd stood on the beach and he told them many things in the parables saying, a sower went out to sow and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil and immediately they sprang up. But since they had no depth of soil, but when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. I want to go back to these people that come to Christ. The seed is planted, the thorns start to grow, and they're choked out. And I always think there's no need really for them to be choked out, is there, if they can come to somebody right? And, and reaffirm the faith. Other seeds fell on the good soil and produced grain and some hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. 
And then he said, he who has ears, let them hear. When, when Jesus said this to people, he said, listen to what I'm telling you, this is the truth. But this parable is often used to, to judge and forgetting that the harvest is not until the end. And what seems like crop failure to many of us may ultimately yield a harvest. It may not be 100, it may not be 60, but in the good ground, even 30-fold is allowed. And what I'm saying here is we don't know about who is going to stay with Christ, okay? Only Christ knows. We look around and say, well, that person came to church, he's gone now, it's, he's ruined, or she's ruined. Not, that's not so. Not till the end. Not until Christ comes again. A great many people don't understand church, so they don't attend for the right reasons. They have little or no knowledge of doctrine. Again, they have little or no knowledge of doctrine. When I came to the church, I had no knowledge of doctrine. I didn't even know how to spell doctrine. Okay? And I'm telling you, I felt like a guy that was in a valuable china closet in the dark walking around. I could hear stuff breaking. And there was nobody there to grab me by the arm and say, well, stop, stop. Let me show you how to get out of here. Let me get the light on. Okay, we don't want this china, my blessings, you don't want to, you don't want to ruin them. So they change churches every two years or so, and they go from the left to the right and muddle in the middle because they go for things that are alluring for a time. And when they get bored, they move on. I'm sure you've seen people like that. They may go because of friends and networking, right? Hey, I got a friend, come to church. They come to church, they're with you, and they know you. So they come to church, they're really not getting anything out of it. And maybe you haven't really, although you're a friend with them, maybe you haven't really talked about church, what church is. And off they go. That particular church may be close, or it has a Saturday night service, or three types of services on Sunday morning, traditional, contemporary, zombie apocalypse, emo, goth, vampire, <laughs> Sunday school classes that teach financial planning, dating skills, or how to be holy in 10 weeks, and maybe even how to power pray in just 60 seconds a day to get God to have it your way. <laughs> they, think, they think the epistles are the wives of the apostles. Well, we've talked about this, right? About doctrine. They don't know doctrine. They haven't read the Bible. And they think Ezekiel has had a close encounter with UFOs. The band is rocking and hip-hopping, and maybe there are plenty of possible mates. Indeed, they go for many of the same reasons that people frequent a bar. While some of the more sedate topics I mentioned have some merit to be addressed from biblical basis, it's possible that many would not like to hear what the Bible has to say on some of those issues. They would prefer that annotated and culturally relevant versions that might not be as strict, judgmental, legalistic, or harsh. True, some have gone pharisaical in those areas, but tossing out the baby, tossing the baby out with the bathwater, as a cliche says, is not the proper redress for those extremes. Well, not all megachurches are compromising their brains out trying to figure out the next Madison Avenue campaign to increase their numbers. You do have to look at it, scripture, and see how many of those type churches ever existed. 3,000 were converted on Pentecost. Now you think, wow. It's a big church. Get this. But many of those were only in town for Passover and went back to their homes to preach what they had just received on that day. It wasn't a mega church. It was just 3,000 people that happened to be there. 
okay, and got the word at Pentecost and went back in the spirit and preached to other people. Laodicea was a big church, but it was all messed up. Lukewarm, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. You don't believe me, read Revelations. Corinth had all the gifts, but was super carnal. Not exactly a pattern to follow, but that pattern is amongst us today in the denominational churches, the undenominational churches, and even the Pentecostal churches. I and others, I know, we've pondered what would happen if some of the mega churches would start dropping some things that they used to lure or to maintain crowd and just had a solid expository preaching. If you don't know the word expository, look it up. I looked it up. I know what it means, but I forgot now. <laughs> Dump all the merit of age group, special interest groups, Sunday school classes, and just have one class from 18 until glory. We're all together. How many would they lose? And yet, the older are supposed to teach the younger, but they're never together in, teaching, in a teaching context. Why? Even in the morning services, they're not together. The old folks are in a traditional service, and then the middle-aged people like me are in the contemporary service, and then the young adults are in the alternative service. Maybe we should tone down the band so that there's good music without the band looking like they just came back from traveling with some secular heavy metal group or rock group. Make the sound level to where the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit can actually be heard and not drowned out by the drums and the amplifier. Now, I'm telling you, I like music, okay? And I'm not so excited about all of the conventional hymns all the time. There's other things. I like to jump around and, you know, good stuff, but we can overdo it. How many of you think they'd lose? You know, I was at, uh, I can't remember the church that we usually go to for special events, Cornerstone. Yeah, Cornerstone. I went there one day and I was with Linda and I was looking up on the stage and I go, Linda, that guy playing the guitar, I've seen him before, right? Well, he's a, he's a famous rock guy. And he's playing up on the, on the stage. Um, but when I saw him, he's a lot more crazy than how he was on the stage at Cornerstone. But it was interesting that there he was. What if these mega churches dump Starbucks? <laughs> you might have an insurrection, right? Let's face it, I like Starbucks. I like their chai, hot chai tea. So, What if we make the kids sit down with their parents from about the age of 10 on? We preach and teach on third grade level these days, so that would profit the spirit of Nehemiah in chapter 8, verse 3. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from morning until midday, <laughs> before the men and the women and those who could understand and the ears of all the people that people who were attentive unto the book of the law. Hmm. Sounds like they didn't worry about the length of the service that was keeping them from getting to Cracker Barrel or Monica's or Carmen's or back home for the Sunday NFL game. Jesus did just that. He stopped the miracles and the feeding of the masses. He gave them some hard doctrine and what happened to his crowd. At one point, he had four and 5,000 heads of families who at least had some of their families with them since there was a boy there that he used the boy's lunch to feed the, the mega crowd, right? On the day of Pentecost, the assembled congrega congregation was... 120. Again, the scripture that we're focusing on here, I'm going to read again. But there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. 
And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted, granted him by the Father. I'm going to stop just for a second. And this is Bill talking. Yes, I believe there's predestination. But why would God give us free will if we couldn't get down on our knees and cry out to Jesus and cry out for deliverance, for being, for saved? I want to be saved. I believe in you. And and why would Jesus say, "Um, no, there's predestination? I think that though there is predestination, God knows which one of us is going to be calling out and which aren't. But I do believe we've got a part in it. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. That's an important statement that he's made, and it's a statement that we have to make. I've come to know, Jesus, that you are the Holy One of God. I've come to know, Jesus, that you're my Savior. I've come to know that you can deliver me because God gave you that authority. Notice, as the crowd dwindled, he did not question his methods. When he, he did this, Jesus said many hard things. If you go back, in John, when you read John, he says many, many hard things. No fluff and make you comfortable stuff just to please the crowd. And I am proud to say that in this church, I have never heard Pastor George do that. Okay, he's never tried to candy apple something that should be, not be candy appled. And it's hard. And I'm sure that people have left him, and I'm sure it's hurt him, but... But because our heart is true to Jesus, Jesus is going to reward us someday. He comforted those who needed it and angered many. What he did was not in any chapter of the modern church growth manual. You know, they have these manuals, big thick manuals on how to grow the church. Um, I used to read them. I thought that they were really important. Little did I know that I had another manual here that overrode that manual. And... What do I care about growing the church? It's not mine. It's the Christ's church. And he'll grow it when he's good and ready. That would have been a sermon lesson just suggested only for the inner circle and not for the masses. Yet it was, it was it's just wonderful material that, that Jesus preached to the people. He was trying to teach them a spiritual lesson that they should have understood from their own daily life, but For some reason, they were blinded. John chapter 6, verse 54 and 55. This is a great one. I love this one. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks on my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up upon the last days. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Oh, red flag. Can you imagine? Can you imagine someone that has no idea about who Jesus is and what he's talking about? The first thing they're saying is, well, I guess to become a Christian, I've got to be a cannibal. And where does that end? Where does that end? Who can I eat and who can I eat? Right? But let me say this. As we eat food, its structure changes to nourish us, and it becomes us. Get it? And when we take in his words, they nourish us, and it changes us to become more like him. They did not get the analogy or understand the parables because they were only there for miracles. They took it in a literal sense, as many did over the centuries, and accused Christians of cannibalism. They couldn't understand him because they were only interested in the next miracle and where they were going to get their next meal from him. We love entertainment. I I'm kind of glad I didn't live back then because if I was going there and watching him do all these miracles, okay, and he was feeding me, I may have missed the boat. 
because as you know, guys, I love food. Okay. And there was a point in my life where food was a driving factor, okay? Overrode everything, okay? But now Jesus Christ is my driving factor. And food is good, but he is so much better. They did not believe in him as God in the flesh, but he was like a cookie from a free cookie jar and a source of entertainment to them. Hey, Jesus is down by the lake. Let's go down there and see what he's going to do today. Oh, by the way, we may get a free cookie because he might be feeding. Right? That's how they thought. As everyone was going away, he turned to Peter and he asked him if he was leaving. Peter said there was nowhere to go as Jesus had the words of eternal life. Indeed, you're weary, fearful, and doubt-ridden. Where will you go? Only his words can address those issues and give you eternal life. Nothing else and no one else can address those issues. Those of you who lusted after the leeks and onions of Egypt, are you content with what you found? Now, okay, in case you don't know, I'm back in the Old Testament now. <laughs> it was Numbers chapter 11, verse 5. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost, nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. These are the words of the Jews when they're out running around in the desert, right? And they're not getting the nice food that they got in Egypt. I remember all that good stuff I had in Egypt. All of a sudden they forgot about, hey, guess what? You had to make X amount of bricks a day. And by the way, when, when, you, when you ticked off the pharaoh, he decided he's not going to give you any straw to put them together. Okay? And you're going to have to work 24 hours a day shifts to get out the amount of bricks that he wanted. They don't remember that. They just remember some of the, the good stuff. So are the words of eternal life in the old worldly life you return to? Or has that returnally brought heartache, pain, and even death of relationships and other losses. Now, most of us sitting here, this might not be for you, but there might be one here that it's for, or one out. in YouTube that, that's hearing this. So I say, come back to Jesus. Only he has the words of eternal life, and he's willing to take you back. Remember when the prodigal son left, took everything that was, that was supposed to be given to him as inheritance, took it, wasted it away, okay, and all of a sudden he goes, hey, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't what I thought it would be. I need to get back there. And it was so bad, he said, I need to get back there and I don't need to be the son. I just need to go back there and I can be the servant and at least I'll get some food. Some have turned away from relationship with him and look for eternal life in religion. What does that mean? What it means is you come into church every morning and you think it's a duty and you think that when you get that mark and then you haven't missed anything all year, even as a grown-up, you're going to get a gold star. Okay, but, but spiritually, you've learned nothing, or you've experienced nothing, or you've matured nowhere. Hey, Pharisees, neither you or the Sadducees are on spot. In fact, you're so far off of it, it's sad. The words that Jesus speak are life. The letter kills as much as unbelief. You can never find him in rituals, rules, and good deeds. I have a friend. I'm not going to go there. But I'll tell you this, if you think for one minute that your good deeds will get you into heaven and you trounce on the cross, you need to sit down and talk to somebody else that will give, right, give you the right, sometimes you need to open up the map and look at the route so you can get back online. God expects perfect. Now, the statement I'm making right now, I want you to listen very carefully, and I'm going to do a little explaining, but 
God expects perfect, and even our good works are like tainted as, as filthy rags. We cannot be perfect unless we are covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. All of our good works are like tainted rags. You know, that translated as used minstrel rags, okay? There's no hope for eternal life in them. Come back to him and hear him to find life. We have no life. We have no eternal life, but we have no life here right now without Jesus Christ. Have you left Jesus because science seems to conflict with his words? There is no conflict between God and true science. He created the universe. The pseudoscientists have a problem understanding. There is much of what is called science that is more sci-fi and faith than empirical science. They can portray a whole human family scene based on one tooth, and later it's proved to be the tooth of an extinct pig. (laughs) They come up with colors and skin patterns when only bones are found. Grand imagination, but not real science. When they come up with something that destroys their theories, they mock it, but will not admit the facts or investigate further. And you wonder why? Why? Because they don't believe in Jesus Christ. They don't believe in God. They don't believe God created the universe. They think they know more than God does. Okay? And they're so hard-hearted, they won't accept that they're going to be wrong. Okay? That's blind faith and not science. Well, we've made some great strides in modern medicine, and I know this. In technology, there is no eternal life in science. Indeed, if we manage to eradicate disease and people live a thousand of thousands of years on a myriad of M-class planets, planets like Earth, it will be useless as the universe is dying. They say energy is dissipating and one day there will be nothing but cold, lifeless rocks in the universe. The hope of modern science is death of an entire universe no matter what we do or achieve. It's time to return to Jesus, who is the way, the truth, the life, that holds the universe together and far, with far better plans for eternity than even empirical science. Will you find salvation in government? I want you all to listen to this one carefully, because you know what? We have, some of us are very patriotic, ultra-patriots in America, and sometimes America becomes more important than than Jesus. Will you find salvation in government? The Herodians and the Zealots thought their politicians could improve their lives. Governments come and go. If you look at history and what is going on now in the Ukraine, in Syria, in Turkey, and a, a myriad of other countries, okay, it's easy to see that there is death involved in the transition between takedown and setup and often during the regimes. Often the words used by politicians promise life, but even if they're sincere, they have no real power to bring it to fruition. But sometimes we think that, you know, our president or our senator has got supernatural powers, and they don't. If we're smart, we better pray to Jesus that he will give them some sense. Only the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords can give you words that bring eternal life. There's no eternal life in stuff. Many have turned away from God for materialism, and that's a worldview. Believing that he who dies with the most toys wins. Solomon had it all, and in the classes he called it all vanity. Can you imagine? Here's a man that had everything. Any woman that he would want, all the money that he could ever use, all the stuff 
he surrounded himself with, and in the end he called it pure vanity. You cannot take it with you. Okay, here's the one I, I talked to my wife about all the time. You can't take it with you, so he who dies with the most toys dies with nothing. So I tell Linda when she gives me my money, I blow it right away. Hey, you can't take it with you. Okay, that's a sin, but I'm just telling you that that's what I'm thinking. Many rich people get into trouble or are depressed because after a while, you've basically bought everything you can use and much of what you will never use. And what's left? The same old things. At some point, materialism becomes a bore. If you read Ecclesiastes, you see that with Solomon. All of a sudden, all this stuff is just a bore to him. Extra curricular activity that he doesn't even want to be bothered with. It's no longer attractive to the person or people. And as you write, realize you're trading your life for things that do not last, lose their satisfaction, and are ultimately left behind at death. Come back to Jesus. He will always take you back. He has the words of eternal life and promises you that you will never thirst or hunger again if you drink his blood and eat his flesh. Bazinga. <laughs> what about you? Have you turned away? How's it working for you? It may satisfy for a season, but there's no life in it. Are you thinking about turning away? To whom will you go? You know, we believers are like a herd of water buffaloes. When we're all together in that big herd, we're safe. As each one of us believe and we lift each other up and we're in that big group, the devil, okay, or the ravaging lion is thinking, I'm not going to get beat up trying to get one of those when I know that sooner or later one of them is going to get out of the herd and I can take them. That's easy pickings. 1 Peter 5, verse 8 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. If we move away from Christ, we've got this issue. He's looking for you. And if we're not careful, we'll be devoured. There's nowhere to turn or no one to turn to that will suffice. Only Jesus has the words of eternal life. Go to him if you've turned away or if you're thinking about turning away. He will be there for you. And all I can say is, oh Lord, come. Sometimes the Bible tells us that we're given to this, the devil to, so that he can kind of sift us, right? And that means that as we're given to the devil and he's doing his sifting, it actually strengthens us. And we turn from him and go back to Christ before he can kill us. Okay? Remember what I said. If you've turned away, come back to Christ. He's waiting for us. Amen. But come back quickly, or you might not come back at all. So in summation of this whole entire message, you may be offended or disillusioned, but there's no one to turn to but Jesus Christ. No one. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, creator of all things, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to earth at the perfect time, not to condemn mankind, but to save us. This is how much you love us. We who believe keep our hearts soft 
so that we hear the soft, sweet voice of the Holy Spirit and learn to follow with all our heart and mind and strength. Bring back those who have strayed before Satan can totally have his way. Let us all be a part of your plan to save mankind, however you can use us. To those that don't know you yet, let your light shine on them. Soften their hearts, open their eyes, let them become disciples of Jesus. May you have your way with us. Let us pray and worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you, Bill. Need, you have, need, you, need to have you go home and start working on the next message, okay? So, let me know when it's ready. <clears throat> I think what I most appreciate about what Bill just shared is he really brought it back to the basics, to the simple things. Uh, we have a tendency to make things so complicated and, and build them up so much, and, and all of a sudden, Jesus isn't there anymore. <laughs> He's, he's still in the same place he was, but we've kind of moved on and, and wonder what's wrong. Um, it reminds me of that Matt, Matt Redman song, Getting Back to the Heart of Worship. And if you know anything about the history of that song, they literally did that, where they got rid of the sound equipment, the microphones and everything, and just got back to simple worship of the Lord. Um, I don't know if you've been following this week and even the previous week a little bit, what's been going on down in um, Kentucky at Asbury University. If you haven't been paying attention or having it come across your, your um, observation, look it up. You probably need to know what's going on. We did write a little bit in the bulletin this morning in the article about it, but there's a revival going on down in this, this Asbury University. Um, <clears throat> this has been going on for like 10 days now, I think, around, I'd say, two weeks now. I'm um, going on around the clock, and people are just staying and lingering like night and day. Um, classes have been canceled, and it's now spread to some other colleges. And there's people of all ages, like all over the world, flying in to see what's, what's going on. Um, if you look it up, what, what you'll be struck with more than anything else is the simplicity of it, which is, takes us back to what Bill does share, and how much of the content is, is worship. Worship. And we've been talking about worship on and off in our church lately because I just feel so much like we need to get back to, to worship. Um, a key to, to true worship is being unhurried. Anytime we're hurried, we give God so many minutes for, for whatever it is, whether it's the sermon or the worship or prayer or this or that. Anytime we're in a hurry, uh, you're really binding the hands of God. I don't know if it's possible to tie the hands of God, but you can tie the hands of God in your life, I can tell you that, by being in a hurry, by only giving him so much time. Um, and I just wonder if the Holy Spirit isn't trying to speak across the world in this hour, trying to get his people to slow down and to be unhurried and take time to worship him, to acknowledge him, to love him, to read his word. Um, and I just wonder if, if the believers in the world will do that with a heart of, that's pure, a heart that's simple, a heart that's uncomplicated. I just wonder if that won't, won't or wouldn't lead to, to a greater spread of the gospel to people who are yet unsaved. Because they'll be drawn to that which is genuine and not that which is full of a lot of hype. I've seen a lot of comments about the Asbury University revival that's going on. And one of the most recurring comments is there's no big-name speakers down there. There's no big-name worship leaders down there. It's just students at a school, just simple people that are, don't want to go home, but just want to be in the presence of the Lord and give the Lord time to, to move. So something to think about. Thank you again, Bill, for getting us back to this, the simplicity of Jesus, the simplicity of the gospel. Why don't we stay in for the benediction and then we'll go off the live stream and continue with a few, few, few more things in the house. <clears throat> Receive now the benediction of the Lord. Now may God be above you to bless you, Amen. beneath you to uphold you, Amen. around you to protect you, Amen. within you to sanctify you, Amen. and before you to guide you. Amen. And may Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and throughout eternity. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat>